What is curiosity? How does it work? And how do we best cultivate and develop it in our students? These are some of the questions I had a chance to ask earlier today of education researcher Dr. Susan Engel. I'm going to show you the interview, but before I do, let me introduce Dr. Engel very quickly. Dr. Susan Engel is a senior lecturer in psychology at Williams College and is the director of the program and teaching there. Her research interests include children's narrative, play, and the development of curiosity, and more generally, teaching and learning. In 1997, Engel co-founded an experimental school in New York, where she continues to serve as an educational advisor. She's written numerous books on issues ranging from how memory works to the how and the why of children's storytelling. Her most recent is a book she co-authored with her son, Sam Levin, called A School of Our Own, the story of the first student-run high school and a new vision for American education. So here's the interview I did with Dr. Engel, and if you're like me and you find the idea of curiosity and how it works fascinating, uh, you'll find this interview to be a real delight. So we are here today with Dr. Susan Engel. We're talking about curiosity in the learning process, which is a huge part of the learning process, and it, there's just not a whole lot of literature out there. So it's, uh, Dr. Engel's book has uh, you know, closed a lot of those gaps and kind of given us uh, you know, somewhere to start. And as a former teacher and a teacher of future teachers, uh, it's really difficult to go over curiosity because there's just not a whole lot written about curiosity. Yeah. Um, and the first question I have for you to kind of get a feel for curiosity and the way it works in schools or maybe sometimes doesn't work in schools is there's a great story you have in your, your book about a uh, class, I think it was a middle school science class that you observed, if, I'm, if memory serves. About, I think it was fourth grade, but it could have been sixth grade. Right. It's, uh, and you talk there about um, a science lab where students seem to be... Uh, kind of uh, really curious about the materials and the teacher being the teacher has to kind of shut them down. Can you explain that story a bit and then illustrate what it says about curiosity in schools? Sure. So I was in a classroom, a really nice classroom of about 22 kids, um, sort of the tail end, as I recall, of elementary school, maybe just the beginning of middle school, maybe it's fifth grade. And uh, the teacher had introduced this very lively hands-on activity uh, the, in which little groups of kids were given these materials and the purpose of the activity was to give them a hands-on experience of how wheels change motion and change the way you can pull things and it was supposed to give them some sense of how Egyptians might have first invented wheels and they had these little measuring devices and these, pla these sort of slabs of wood and then these little dowels and the idea is pull the wood without the dowels and see how hard it is to get it going any to go any distance in a quick period of time and then put the board on the, some dowels and pull it and you'll discover for yourself what it was like to realize that wheels could change everything. And But she, she gave them the materials and a worksheet and she said, you play with this, you work on this and fill out the answers on the worksheet. And she wandered around the room, she's a very nice woman encouraging them, that's awesome, a way to go and the kids were all very involved in it and she kept saying little reminders which turns out to be relevant to some other research I've done um, about, you know, don't forget to fill out the worksheet and good job on the worksheet and you're almost done. And little, very subtle hints that had to do with doing what they were supposed to and sticking to a script. Well, at some point, inevitably, because this always happens with kids uh, who are allowed to, a group of kids kind of got distracted and they got interested in some other things about the materials. So instead of doing the thing the worksheet told them to do about discovering how much faster it went when they pulled it on the dowels, they started to pile the dowels up on one another, they started to swing the measuring unit to see how far they could swing it, they started to create all kinds of little contractions with the equipment. And the teacher happened to walk by as this was going on and she said, uh oh, kids, don't do that now, I'll give you time to experiment at recess, this is time for science. Mm. Sure. And you know, when that happened, it was like I saw a big billboard in my head. This is what's happening to curiosity in classrooms. Wow. Um, so for me, that story illustrates a couple of things. One, that very often the intellectual capacity that probably is most important to being well-educated, the desire to know new things and the ability to find answers to those questions, tends to get pushed to the side in classrooms. Um, so she saw the experimenting as something you would do 
in, in the non-school part of the day, the recess part of the day, because somehow this thing called science was something she had to get through, and that had predetermined activities and answers to go with it. Well, that's the opposite of what it should be. Science is all about learning how to ask good questions and then figure out how to find answers to your questions. So what the children were doing on their own was the real science. The second thing I think that uh, it's a reminder of is that a classroom, a, curiosity is not just good versus bad. That teacher was a nice teacher. That activity was very lively. The kids liked it. It's not as if any classroom where kids are running around is a good classroom and any classroom where kids are sitting down quietly is a bad classroom. So it sort of breaks up our usual kind of stereotypical thinking about, about what should be going on. Sure. It's, uh, it strikes me as almost like um, kind of a, a bind because on one hand, uh, it, your, your research also kind of notes that as much as we do know about what can uh, kind of induce curiosity and cultivate it, uh, it's also not a very predictable thing. Right. So uh, on one hand, teachers have a lot of stuff they need to get through. And you, and you talk about how crucial curiosity is in ensuring deep learning. But on the other hand, it's also um, it's not necessarily at the end of the day that uh, uh, you can direct curiosity as easily as it takes to learn this, that and the other thing. Well, it's certain. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, I, that the word predictable is such a great word to use in this in this context, because we both know that teachers like many professionals depend on a certain kind of predictability and we know that teachers use scripts during the day mental scripts they're not even aware of all their scripts now this is going to happen then i'm going to say this then the kids are going to do this and those scripts are vital we all need them to get through our professional day but they're terrible if we become too tied to them especially since the process of discovery is a somewhat as you say unpredictable unscriptable process. Now that said, I think it can be changed. I think that we need different scripts. Uh, and actually the book, the other book that I wrote last year, which is called The End of the Rainbow, um, talks about this. How you could have, a, you could imagine a classroom where instead of saying, I want kids to learn how to use this measuring device and learn some concrete information about how wheels were invented, you could say, I want kids to learn how to ask a question and then revise the question to make it more answerable. Okay, yeah. That's a really good scientific piece of the scientific method. We all know as scientists that your first question is rarely the one you do the experiment on. You have to think, oh, I could refine that question, or that question is not actually answerable with data. Sure. I need to change it a little. We could make that an educational goal, and then you'd go into the classroom and say, how do I get these kids to ask questions they really want the answer to? Sure. And then what do I do to help them make their questions better? And if your goal was to, at, by the end of sixth grade or whatever, not be able to list a lot of information about wheels or Egyptians or whatever, but to revise questions until they're really good, you could, you could have that as a sort of guiding script, and you'd still have some order and predictability in your day and in the child's learning, but you'd be focusing on something a little more intellectually powerful. Um, so, in fact, there are a lot of ways that teachers and classrooms can help children use their curiosity mm -hmm. in more effective or more powerful ways and learn how to fulfill their curiosity in more grown-up ways. Great. So, uh, before we get into some of the specifics that you go into in your book about how curiosity can be cultivated and teachers and schools, how, how they should go about doing that. I want to ask some questions about it, kind of what curiosity is, because you distinguish even between uh, types of curiosity in the book. So you almost more of a general curiosity versus the kind of curiosity that's a more specific, really uh, fine-tuned thing. So can you explain uh, the, the different types of curiosity that there might be? Sure. So I'll start with what I consider to be the most powerful and general definition of curiosity. Well, there are two, and they they are very simple, sort of compatible. One is um, Piaget's definition, which was the desire to explain the unexpected, and Jerome Kagan's, which is the desire to resolve uncertainty. And both capture this key feature of curiosity that starts in infancy, which is that we feel curious whenever something happens that violates our expectations, that's a surprise to us. Uh, so when mommy walks in the door every morning when you wake up in your crib, 
and then one day daddy walks in or someone with a crazy hat walks in, you're surprised. It's not what you expected. So you study it. You listen. You reach out. You do whatever. That's the baby experiencing curiosity because they've encountered surprise. And, you know, babies experience and toddlers experience a lot of surprise because almost everything's new to them. Um, every animal they see, every new kind of vehicle, every change in the routine, every, you just name it, which is why children seem to be curious all the time. They are surprised by so much and they have such a need to gather information. Um, so it makes sense developmentally, and sort of from an evolutionary perspective, that as they, as more and more of the day becomes familiar to them and more and more of their daily experience becomes familiar to them, they're not going to have that pervasive, omnivorous kind of curiosity. True. And instead, they're going to become more surprised by the things that are either really novel, you know, I, I mean, someone really crazy, Big Bird walks in or whatever. Um, but there's another piece of this, which is they also, as they narrow in on certain domains that interest them, I mean, imagine the five-year-old who becomes interested in dinosaurs or bugs or trucks or whatever it is, um, they begin to pay attention to subtler details which surprise them. So that brings me to a distinction we make in the literature between what we call um, sort of diversive curiosity, curiosity about everything, and specific curiosity, right. which is the curiosity we, you know, what you're curious about you, is very different from what I'm curious about. Like I have no interest in cars and I don't notice them on the road and I couldn't tell you Right. what engine they have. My husband knows a lot about cars. Um, I'm very curious about food. I love to cook. I know a lot about food. I notice everything yeah. that comes my way food-wise and so forth and so on. Uh, that starts early in life. So by the time children are four or five, they have specific areas of interest. And it has a lot of um, importance for schools because you're never going to be as curious about something you don't have a deep interest in as you are something you do have a deep interest sure. in. And actually, the person who's just curious about everything indiscriminately is kind of going to be limited by that because they're never going to go deep enough. Right, right. You also um, make a really interesting uh, distinction between uh, curiosity and engagement. So uh, one of the quotes you have here is you say that, uh, a teacher can be talking about things that captivate the students, their students can be deeply interested in the topic, quite engaged in discussion or activity, but that in and of itself doesn't mean the children are asking questions or that their questions necessarily reflect curiosity. I feel like that's a really big distinction for, for teachers to keep in mind, that engagement and curiosity uh, may kind of look the same in some ways and overlap, but they're not necessarily the same. That's exactly right. And you know, it's interesting. So it's relevant as a researcher too. When we first started to look at this and we'd go into classrooms and we were just interested in seeing how much curiosity there was. And we had these ideas when I say we, me and my students, that we'd see was it happening more at the math table or was it happening more when kids were building things or was it, and did boys do it more than girls? Those were the kinds of questions we had. But before we could collect data to answer those questions, we had to figure out what constituted a moment of curiosity. Mm, yeah. And that's when we began to realize, look, it's not just being deeply engaged, because I'll give you an example. You uh, imagine, um, well, I'll give you a kid example and a grown-up example. I'm often, when I'm cooking, very engaged. I love it. It feels good. I have to pay attention. I like what I'm making. But I'm not particularly curious if I'm making something I'm very familiar with. Or even if I'm not, even if I'm following a recipe, mm. I'm very attentive, I'm very engaged. Um, or imagine a musician, young or old, who's deeply engaged in making music with a violin or piano or drums, but they're not, at that moment, expressing a lot of curiosity. Same thing with kids. They could be building with blocks or, or think of a kid who, the, the kid who really loves math problems. Pa I hear I mean paper and pencil math problems. They might be doing that to get the right answer and love that process and be quite good at it, but not experiencing a lot of curiosity. But for the teacher, it's important not to mush all these things together because they're not the same thing. Right, sure. So let's um, move to some suggestions for kind of how curiosity gets cultivated. Um, you give several in, in your research of, of uh, what research shows helps 
induce or cultivate curiosity and things that detract from curiosity. So one of them I noticed was that uh, students are often attracted to things with complexity. And you talk about in schools and in classrooms, uh, a lot of well-meaning people will in, uh, inadvertently do the opposite, which is we want to take the, the ambiguity out because we maybe fear that things look too complicated and students will lose interest. But you say research kind of shows us exactly the opposite, that where students Absolutely. hang out is really those places where the unexpected does happen. Absolutely. That's beautifully put. Um, um, <laughs> Well, so there are a couple of things. One is I think that teachers, and I think they've been pressured in this way in recent years, they're so eager to get across whatever information or skill they are under pressure to get across that they think the more they can simplify it and the more they can strip it down, the more likely the kid is to take it in. And all, I, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about food analogies as I told you I love cooking. But it's like making thinking because you know a certain type of food is nutritious the plainer you are the the, the more bland it is the more the kid's going to get the nutrition but something can taste good you can make a delicious salad with all kinds of flavors and the kids would still be getting the good stuff the celery the lettuce the whatever you don't have to strip it down to some tasteless bland mush for it to be useful to them nutritionally and the same is true of information so what I see happening is, and this is the worst offender in my view, is our textbooks, which aim to make everything so transparent and simple and clear that the kid will literally digest it instantly. But who wants to digest something that's totally bland and pre-digested and, um, you know, sort of without subtlety or flavor, so to speak? Well, I guess to go on with that food analogy, uh, it's also once you digest it, there's no point in being curious about it any longer, right? If it makes sense yeah. to you... Yeah, Why be so curious that, about it? I've done. I got that. I can do that on the test. But is there anything I wanted to know about it? So in one study that I cite in the book, beautiful study, I'm forgetting the author's name, but they gave, um, this was middle schoolers, I believe, uh, passages to read. So it was like a literacy comprehension kind of activity. But in one condition, the kids got a very straightforward, sort of stripped down, clear, textbook-like version of the material. In another condition, students were given the exact same material, but they were given it in, it was in writing that was much more sort of idiosyncratic and complicated in terms of vocabulary. It included what the authors referred to as seductive details. Those are details that don't have any inherent information. They're not essential to the content, but they change the narrative, they change the expression of it. So in language work, we talk about this as the difference between transparent and opaque language. Sure enough, the kids who got the more the seductive details in the material, who read the more complex version of these passages, remembered the material better, understood it better, and showed more interest in reading more. Huh. And that's just a good sort of that that captures something that I think is true throughout the curriculum, which is that uh, when you avoid complexity and avoid surprise and avoid mystery and avoid idiosyncrasy you not only don't enhance learning, as you said, you don't particularly invite kids to dive in. So uh, what can teachers and schools potentially do to kind of harness that? Okay, if we know that students may actually be attracted by things like ambiguity and stuff like that, uh, what can and should teachers do? I know that's a very general question because different teachers teach different things and et cetera, yeah. but. Well, I, I guess there are a couple of things I would say. Um, one is, you know, this is a more general comment about what teachers can do, it's not just to that piece, but the broader issue of how to encourage curiosity in the classroom. They have to get in touch with their own curiosity. And I don't hold them accountable for that in alone. It's also schools of education. So instead of starting with how to manage a classroom or the material you have to convey and how to convey it most efficiently, start with reminding yourself what you're curious about and under what conditions and what you do when you feel curious and, or what you do when you don't feel curious and what parts of the day quell your curiosity and relate that to what you do as a teacher because it's very, one of the things that research in my lab has shown is that one of the most powerful ways that teachers can cultivate curiosity in their students is by modeling curiosity. And you can't fake that. Sure. You have to really be curious to, to, to 
make it contagious to your students. Right. So that's one thing. Another thing, and then this goes back to what we were saying before about the difference between engagement and curiosity, is I think every teacher should be a researcher and begin to notice when kids are curious in their classroom and what ways they express their curiosity and about what, and just as important, what happens next. So let's say you record with a video camera or some audio you know, equipment or just on paper and pencil, you record all the questions that kids ask in your classroom once a week or every 10 minutes every morning or whatever your approach is. Then you might start noticing what happens right after they ask the question. What do grown-ups say? What do other kids say? What does the kid do? And I, I do that kind of work as a researcher because I actually want to collect data and analyze it, but a teacher can do that as a researcher in their own classroom to begin to notice where curiosity is happening and where it's not happening. I think it has an added effect, which is just by noticing it, you're more likely to encourage it. Uh, so the things we attend to, the things that are on our minds are the things that we tend to cultivate and give attention to as teachers. So I think that's number two. Number three is sort of a follow-up from those two things, is to make a deliberate decision that you're not going to rush to the completion of every task, that especially when you're working with materials that are interesting, like those little Newtons and the Dows or whatever it might be, and it's not just in science, it's in reading, it could be in history, it could, there's no part of the day when curiosity isn't vital and valuable. Um, but to begin to set aside or, you know, sort of, well, set aside parts of the day when the goal is to help children become curious and pursue their curiosity rather than get to the end of the lesson. And that takes some courage and determination on the part of teachers who feel pushed all the time to finish the task. The trouble is they might be finishing the task at the expense of the really valuable educational goal. Sure. I know one thing I always tell uh, teachers, and I, I don't, I'm not sure if you'd agree with this, but uh, one of the big mistakes we make when, when uh, not cultivating curiosity is that we don't often admit to students when we don't know something. Uh, so if students ask us a question, we often feel like we, we need to be the expert on this thing. And if they see that we don't know it, uh, and like you said, modeling curiosity in some ways that models it. Okay, I'm not sure. I wonder if we can find out the answer to that. That's the, such an important thing to have said. Um, and, you know, I, I see this in college, too. I mean, college, you, you must see it. College professors worry about this, too. What if I get asked a question I don't know? But the best thing you can do is say, God, what a great question. I've wondered that myself. Or, as sometimes happens to me, I think, God, I wish I had thought of that question. I never have. How could we answer that question? And actually, whether it's with 7-year-olds or 20-year-olds, sitting together, you know, they talk about the flipped classroom all the time. What better use of classroom time than modeling for your student what you as an expert learner, whether you're an elementary school teacher or a college teacher or a high school teacher, what you as an expert learner do to get from question to answer, uh, including making some judgments about whether you think you did get an answer or not. So one of the things that I'm very struck by is how rarely we give kids in school a chance to decide for themselves whether they're happy with their answer. And in the psychology of curiosity outside of schools, we know that if, if anybody is really curious about something, they don't stop till they're satisfied. Uh, so if you want to know what's under, let's say you see a strange shape under a, under a little cloth. You're not going to go over and, and smash it down and then look to someone and say, did I answer my question? Did I find out what's under the cloth? You're going to know when you answered your question because you're going to feel better. We don't give kids that chance in school. And that's the most valuable thing we could teach them. So if, if a kid asks a question and you don't know the answer, not only can you say, oh, God, let's, let's think about what, what it would take to answer that question. What kinds of information would we need? Let me think. Maybe I do have that information. So that you not just kind of go through the motions, but really work with them, model, pursuing the answer, and then decide together, was that a good answer? Did that satisfy us? Maybe we asked the wrong question, or maybe we went to the wrong source. I can't think of a more valuable way to use time in school than to pursue that with your students. So I agree with you. So um, final question, when I read your book, um, 
I, I was, uh, I don't know if this is just me reading something into it or you, uh, but I came away sensing that you were a bit pessimistic about how uh, schools and teachers work in terms of curiosity. Almost the sense that the research we know about curiosity tells us that teachers in schools are, are very widely doing this wrong. And obviously, you're not blaming anyone for it, but... Um, I'm what blaming is, someone, but not teachers. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, so what is your sense of that? It's, can we, uh, as, it, as I guess if teachers are watching this, can they come into their classrooms and, and do some things to, in some ways, um, fight against a system that really does seem like it's not very good at Absolutely. cultivating? Absolutely. So like I said, I wrote this book last year, The End of the Rainbow, about changing the goals of education. And I end it with a, a chapter on new ways to measure, or new measures for these new educational goals that are very concrete. And I had a lot of principals, public school principals all over the country, call me and say, I love those ideas. I want to do it. What, what do I do? And my answer was, start doing it. So I would say the same thing to teachers. But first, let me back up. I'm not a pessimistic, um, because you know when you write a book like this, you do it out of optimism. You do it out of the thought, you know, now we know what curiosity, how curiosity develops, and if we know which things, which behaviors encourage it, and which behaviors suppress it, then we can do something about it. So I actually wrote it out of a out of a kind of um, chronic optimism on my part. Um, that said, I do I don't think curiosity is being cultivated in schools the way that it should be. Um, and I don't think teachers are being given the support they, they need and want and deserve uh, to figure out how to do this. But they could. So there are two things that I would say about that. One is a great deal of the research shows that when kids are curious, they learn more. So even if you stick with the more conventional or standard educational goals that we currently have in schools, just as a way of getting kids to learn more, it's valuable. It's, in fact, it's priceless to get kids to be curious because when someone's curious, they learn very easily. In fact, it's the greatest fuel for learning we know of. It's even greater than, let's say, motiv motivating a kid by promising them a good outcome, like a, a good grade or a reward. When they really want to know something, it's hard for them not to learn it. So it, th there's that reason for doing it. And the other, as I said, is that actually if you can teach kids to pursue their curiosity, you're giving them a, an intellectual tool that's quite powerful. Um, and I think most teachers, given a chance to bring that into their classroom, would. I think it takes some deliberate effort, whether that's setting aside parts of the day when you're going to make this your priority, or parts of the year, or just paying a little more attention to it throughout, noticing the questions they ask and giving that a little more time, uh, a little more attention, and then finally, of course, what the hell, why not say this? I think teachers need to get together and talk about it together. Because if they agree as a group, whether it's the third grade teachers or all the teachers or the science teachers or whatever group meets, I think if they were to say, let's try this for a year, let's make this a goal. Yes, we have to do all the things we have to do, but let's see if we can also get kids to ask better questions this year. It wouldn't, it doesn't take any equipment, it doesn't take anything except a, a mindset on the part of the teachers to sort of put that into the classroom. And I will say that if you visit as many classrooms as I do, you see that some teachers are doing this anyway. This is just who they are, and it's a priority to them. And so it's happening. It's, it's happening all over the place. Great. Well, a uh, very optimistic note to end on, and that's a, that's a good thing. So, Dr. Engel, I appreciate uh, your time and sharing some of your, your research with us. Great pleasure to talk to you.